Okay, so Ophelia, you're a philosopher by training, but you've ended up working in quite close quarters with psychologists and neuroscientists in pursuit of questions about the mind. And I just wonder what that collaboration is like, really. What, what role does a philosopher have in, in that kind of company? I think we have a, uh, a kind of journal view and philosophy that uh, if you work too closely with people involved in empirical work, you're sort of selling your soul because suddenly you're becoming a scientist or you're um, uh, sort of making the discipline subservient to the sciences. But what's beautiful about philosophy of mind and cognitive neuroscience is that there is a shared object of investigation. Mm. And one of the main questions is, how should we even start thinking about this object? That is the mind. That uh, is it something which is made of different components and you know different modules, or is that idea of thinking about the mind the wrong thing? Should we think that there are two systems, a very fast way of operating and a very slow deliberative way, and mm. system one versus system two? I mean, all these questions are central to the neuroscientist and to the philosophers. Therefore, the collaboration is not about sort of trying really to fit with someone's uh, uh, framework. It's trying to build the framework together. And I guess that's one feature of my (laughs) collaborative life is that the neuroscientists are not in the next building, they're next door in this next room. Okay. But but so if you've got... um these two sets of people in the same room thinking about the same problems doing the same work one wonders what uh, the distinction between science and philosophy is what do philosophers bring to that conversation the best thing is actually to come and um, witness what these exchanges look like because i think that if you were in the room there would be no question about who is doing what i mean that's no i'm not going to be able to spot Mm. very you know fine grain kind of way of making things better from a statistical analysis point of view. When I make contributions to say the way an an experimental design is going, it's always on the basis of a conceptual difference I want Mm. to get at or something where I think we're not distinguishing between two things. So, And scientists have a much more practical uh, or technical way of getting at the same questions. The nice thing, I guess, something I've learned um, is that you're probably the worst judge of your contribution in a collaboration. Mm. You know, especially as a philosopher, because you you make rather big points, and you know, you're saying, "Oh, have you thought about?" Or you ask questions. You know, actually, isn't there a difference between X and Y, and shouldn't we distinguish? You know, attributions of moral responsibility and attributions of guilt, or, or things like that and people sort of stop and pause and and you might wonder what exactly was your what was so expert about this kind of contribution right and actually you need to defer the response to the people you work with they will be the ones telling you what you contributed they will be the ones showing that they have you know designed an experiment which is not at all like the ones they would have designed without you Mm. And they want to do another one. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess that's the, uh, the best kind of feedback you can, you can expect. And, uh, um, and you provide them with more motivation to do what they're doing. Mm. Because you give them the opportunity to realize that they are addressing not only these specific questions but something which has a deeper mm. set of, of uh, implications for thinking about what our humanity consists of. I wonder if it's a bit like being um, a, a cartographer or something like that, where you're trying to give them you know, a map of the field as a whole, and so it's a kind of bird's eye view, and mm. you can see what areas connect with what other areas, and having done that, you can also see what areas haven't, been explored yet you know mm. where it's just like here be dragons um. I know but that's that's a nice thing to compare it to uh, cartography but at the, at the moment it gives you a bit of vertigo when you compare these two scales I mean problems like the nature of consciousness or 
the relations between emotions and, and rationality. I mean, all these big questions. When you suddenly have to go and look at empirical ways of addressing them, you're suddenly zooming on a very, very tiny part. You know, it's a bit like Google Earth software, as if you were going very fast from the <laughs> the world view yeah. to zooming on the courtyard of uh, a single house. Mm. You say, from my perspective, that you know, I can tell you that these are the broader sets of directions that exist, and they can tell you from the ground really what the reality is and yes. what the details work and how the details work and that's that's a very um, as I said reciprocal way of, of looking at things okay that's not... okay well it'll be good to illustrate this with some examples from your specific collaborations with uh, neuroscientists but before we do that I wonder if we could talk a bit about um, some contrasting attitudes to neuroscience within philosophy so, I, on the one hand, I have in mind ordinary language philosophers like Peter Hacker, I suppose, who say that the mind doesn't really have anything to do with neuroscience for conceptual reasons. And then there are people like David Chalmers who say something similar, but for dramatic kind of metaphysical reasons, like the, the mind has nothing to do with the brain because no amount of discussion of mechanism will ever explain first-person experience and therefore we might have to posit some whole new category of existence to, to account for that. So I just wonder what you think of, uh, of those guys. Well, the first thing to say is that, you know, that's not because some philosophers are eager to collaborate with neuroscientists that mm. uh, all philosophers of mine should collaborate with <laughs> that. So I'm, I'm uh, certainly happy to think that... Uh, especially if you don't share uh, some physicalist assumptions. But as I said, the, the, the most interesting part of the collaboration happens when you talk to people trying to figure out descriptions about how the mind works. And I see no good objection coming from the people you've mentioned for not mm. actually working with the scientists. I mean, the, the, the stronger view would be to say there is nothing to learn about um, the emotions from the enormous amount of work which has been done looking at how the bodily states actually connect your emotional states, how influencing your bodily state will change your emotional states with also aspects of the context, mm. how you can actually... Uh, um, have emotional responses to stimuli which you haven't consciously perceived. I mean, all of this evidence is a huge enrichment to the way we used to think about mm. our emotional lives. And coming from a kind of extreme, ordinary language uh, perspective, I really have a hard time understanding how you could think that the folk psychological concepts we have mm. are better than the robust discoveries that uh, scientists are providing us with. I mean, I, I suppose the argument is something like um, concepts like mind are come from, from ordinary language and from idioms, you know, so I might talk about setting my mind to something or changing my mind or having a dirty mind or something like that mm -hmm. and um, we sh once you've exhausted the study of what we mean by the mind in, in language uh, that's it you know and which isn't to discredit the work that that neuroscience is doing but they they would just say that that's just not what the mind is and, 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 why, and why take this concept of the mind from ordinary language and kind of thrust it into uh, neuroscientific contexts when it doesn't really belong. When language goes on holiday, that's the Wittgenstein catchphrase, right? Well, it's true that well, nobody thinks that they're studying, no experiment address, addresses actually what the mind is, you mm. know, as a whole. <laughs> so if, if you want to say, well, we still haven't got something from neuroscience which comes close to telling us what the mind is or being minded consists of. Mm. Uh, sure, it's because there's not much to be said except the few expressions you've mentioned and then mm. is that all the work we have to do as philosophers? I mean, we might as well leave, you know, 
close the shop and leave the key under the counter because that's <laughs> it. The very program seems to me to be um, doomed. So that's um, ordinary language dealt with um, for now. <laughs> Um, but what do you what do you make of sort of consciousness studies and people like Chalmers who say that that uh, the first person experience will never be explained in terms of uh, brain mechanism? The hard problem of consciousness, as it it's called, um, is not to be minimized in the sense that it's it's diagnosis a gap between two representations mm. or current philosophical intuitive commonsensical representations of what being conscious means and our representations of what neuroscientific explanations can achieve. And from that diagnosis, there is no conclusion to draw and certainly not the one which would consist in saying that this gap is actually reflecting the state of what neuroscience will tell us about consciousness. Mm because the representations we have about neuroscience might well be wrong, and it's getting you know, renewed <laughs> on a regular basis. So I think the, the mechanisms and the kind of theories that will emerge out of the new mechanistic explanations or even some computational accounts of how the, the brain works mm. will actually be more capable of delivering, at least getting closer to addressing some aspects of the question. So no dramatic solutions like panpsychism or something like that? Or you think that's nuts to, to, to push in that direction to say, because we can't yet explain it conceptually or, or mechanically. As I said, if we think you were so right about this gap that it will always be there, mm. then indeed you should sort of start and from the armchair trying to find ways to live with this gap and, mm. uh, but I don't share this diagnosis at all I mean it's a very transient gap which has to do with the imperfection of what our concepts of consciousness is and us being totally crude about what neuroscience can achieve so I don't mm. take that gap to be seriously the hard problem is not it's hard as it is but I think it won't remain hard because it will gradually dissolve as better concepts and better explanations are developed. Okay, well, let's let's have a go on that track then and, and uh, tell me where you are in terms of your collaborations with uh, neuroscientists on, on problems like synesthesia. Synesthesia is strange reports, subjective reports of experiences of colors most of the time accompanying mm. experiences of sounds so people saying that they could see red when hearing middle C or mm. they would see green when uh, they heard certain words or read certain uh, words or so certain letters so what was really interesting from the, the series of discussions I had with scientists about synesthesia and from what I read was to just realize that the question of the very status of the phenomenon, whether it's perceptual or it's a case of perception or a case of mental imagery, mm. was not directly addressed. And if there were episodes of mental imagery, why would the subjects report them as being perceptual? Because the synesthetes are otherwise perfectly capable of making the difference between having the mental image of a cube and rotated, rotating it in their mind uh, and seeing a real cube mm. so why would they suddenly be confused about this distinction so one way to solve that issue is to say well we keep the con our concept of perception intact and concept of mental imagery and we just sort of accept that synesthesia is a third kind of mental phenomenon mm. it's a different kind of seeing and the other option is to say, well, look, it has some characteristics like vividness that explains why people confuse it for perception when it's actually a case of mental imagery. And that's a way of preserving, these two strategies are ways of preserving, if you wish, the distinction between perception and mental imagery mm. as it 
stands, as I said, just by making synesthesia something different or managing to explain why people are confused about where it fits. But there is a, 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 a third strategy, which is to accept to be revisionist mm. about the way the distinction has been drawn. And that's what you are. Yes, that's what I suggested. You could explain quite a lot by accepting that instead of thinking that you should always be in a state which is either a perceptual state or a state of mental imagery at any time, you could perfectly accept that you have contents of your experience which are contents of mental imagery mm. posted within a broader set of contents which are perceptual contents. So right. imagistic states hosted within a perceptual state basically. Now it's, it's true that if you have this way of redrawing the distinction maybe it has consequences for other places where this distinction is useful so mm. by having accepted to revise our distinction on the basis of synesthesia you might be suddenly stuck with some more challenges in other areas right. where you know it has to to do with the nature of illusions or hallucinations and so on and so forth. But it might also have positive consequences. It might open doors up. Exactly. It's opening new ways of looking at the same phenomenon. And as I said, I don't think that uh, we have good reasons to be protectionist with philosophical concepts when results collected by cognitive neuroscience suggest that we might have missed something.